Not every magazine can create a moving image on a two-dimensional printed, two-dimensional printed page. But look at the drawing on the left. Doesn't that appear to be rotating to you? How did we do it? I is it a miracle? Our staff at Turning Point is good, but not that good, says the article. <laughs> the image isn't actually moving, though the circles may appear to be spinning in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. It's an optical illusion, an elaborate visual image that plays tricks on the eyes and brain. Some artists devote their careers to these puzzles, using visual elements such as color, patterns, and light to mislead our perceptions. Our eyes can play tricks on us. Have you ever peeled a pair of socks that looked as black as coal, but which turned out to be navy blue instead against a pair of truly black pants? Even nature has its share of optical illusions. Maybe you thought you saw a bear in the woods, only to discover it was a shadow. Have you ever stood on a coastline, peering into the horizon and tried to distinguish the sky from the sea? Even the reflection of autumn trees on a perfectly still lake can play tricks with your eyes. Sometimes, while making our way through life, we encounter optical illusions of another sort. We look at our situations in life and can't quite figure them out. Our circumstances may appear complex and disturbing. When our world appears to be spinning, we feel like things are out of control, that we're going around in confusing circles. Our minds interpret what we see in a subjective way, but do our perceptions match God's reality? It's hard to view life with eyes bigger than our personal experience, knowledge, or heart, but sometimes we must. Let me explain what I mean using the prophet Jonah as an example. I'm sure you remember his famous story. In the first chapter of his book, God told Noah, uh, Jonah to go into the great city of Nineveh and warn its citizens of impending judgment. Jonah was terrified, as he must have viewed his mission as a suicide assignment. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which was known for its brutality and terrorism. Assyria was the mortal enemy of Judah. To Jonah's way of thinking, walking into Nineveh would be similar to you and me walking into the corner of a terrorist camp and trying to preach the gospel. That was his perception, but that wasn't the reality as God saw it. Jonah's mind misinterpreted God's assignment from a human perspective, so he did what a lot of us do. He followed his instincts rather than his instructions. Fleeing from the presence of the Lord, Jonah boarded a ship and sailed in the opposite direction toward Tarshish and right into a typhoon. Try as he might, he could not outrun the breath of God. The Lord turned the Mediterranean Sea into a roller coaster with dips and plunges that terrified even the seasoned mariners. It's my fault, Jonah said in a paraphrase. The only way to save the ship and its crew is if I abandon the ship. Throw me into the sea and the storm will subside. There again, Jonah's perceptions were wrong. The storms weren't the real problem, it was his sin. What if he had knelt before the Lord, confessed his rebellion, recommitted himself to his God, and offered to go wholeheartedly to wherever his master sent him? In that case, I think the story might have taken a different turn. But Jonah couldn't see that. He only saw a spinning vortex. And into the sea he went. I've tried to imagine what the next moments were like. Already soaked to the skin, Jonah felt his waterlogged robe pulling him downward. Did he simply resign himself and let his limp body sink like a stone? Or did he thrash around trying to tread water and keep his head above the, the waves? In either case, it's hard to imagine his pain in his lungs, the salt in his eyes, the chill in his bones, and then gulp. His next confused impressions were of darkness. Gastric juices, foul smells, half-digested minnows, and slimy seaweed. Of course, the pounding heartbeat of some huge creature that had swallowed him whole, like a mackerel. Jonah must have felt he encountered a house of illusions. Confusing spinning, plunging, descending to the depths. Was he dead or alive? Was this hell, or had he been, well, eaten? We know exactly what he thought, for he described his feelings in the second chapter of the book. Affliction, the belly of Sheol, the deep, the heart of the seas, the floods cast out of your sight, weeds abound my head, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever, the pit fainted. From God's perspective, however, things weren't that bad. The Lord had saved his life, extracted him from deadly peril, rescued him from the storm, saved the sailors aboard his ship, given him a golden chance to start over, and put him on a submarine headed toward home in fulfillment. Being upchucked along the coast, Jonah undoubtedly took a long bath, and then he packed his bag and obediently headed toward Nineveh. His mind was clearer. He would go to Nineveh, he thought, preach doom, and watch the enemy perish under the judgment fires of God, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Once again, Jonah's perceptions didn't match God's reality. To his astonishment, the Ninevites humbled themselves and repented, whereupon God spared the city. This caused another crisis for Jonah, and he poured over God, pouted over God's mercy. 
By sparing Nineveh, the threat against Jonah's own nation was undeterred. This, it seemed to Jonah, was exactly the wrong outcome. How much better to have Nineveh destroyed and the danger to Ju Judah removed? Jonah sat under a vine and brooded, but God sent a worm to destroy the vine. Under the scorching sun, Jonah fumed about his circumstances, which gave the Lord a renewed opportunity to teach him compassion. The Lord said, in effect, Jonah, you are more concerned about a worm, a vine, and your own comfort than you are about the thousands who would have perished without the message I gave you. Jonah evidently saw things God's way, for he wrote down his experiences in a book, which was essentially his testimony. I hope you can see from the book of Jonah that we sometimes look at life's circumstances differently than the Lord does. In every part of this story, God was in control, but Jonah's perception of the events was flawed at every step. According to Psalm 139.16, all our days are written in advance in God's book. Sometimes when we look at the day-sized pages of that book, we see puzzling images and spinning patterns, but God sees every day clearly, and he can clearly lead us all the way. Wisdom is moving from our perceptions to his perspective and seeing life from his point of view. It took Jonah four chapters to do this, and it sometimes takes us a while for us, too. We have to process the unfolding events, but remember, what may be confusing to us is perfectly clear to our omnipotent God. We see obstacles where he sees opportunities. We see predicaments where he sees providence. Where we see spinning wheels, he sees patterns of grace. Chip Ingram wrote, Perceptions are not reality. How you perceive your life, your value, and your destiny doesn't give you the whole picture. You may be seeing yourself and your significance dimly, but your self-perception determines in large measure the way your life will go. It is vital that these deep questions at the core of your being are answered with truth. Dim or mistaken perceptions that aren't in keeping with reality must be challenged and corrected by the light of God's word. That's why the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5-6 This passage tells us how to live more fully in God's realities. We must lean on his optimal truth, and not in the world's optical illusions. Like Jonah, we must learn to trust God's word more than our own perceptions. And we must prayerfully acknowledge him as Lord of every situation. He knows how to direct our paths. He even knows how to redirect them when we head off toward Tarshish. Or some other distraction.